If you have a Bible with you, I want you to open up. We're going to go back to where we started. Uh, if you have been with us for a while, we've been in the series called um, Together. And the idea was that we would look at all the things that we do when we come together on a Sunday morning. We just spend time talking about the obvious stuff, the stuff that everybody should know, but we don't always know why we come together. Why do we worship like we were just doing? Why do we pray? Why do we um, serve together is what I'm talking about. Um, why do we even gather? Why don't we just stay home and do this by ourselves? And so I started out here in uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Is that what I said or did I say 1 Corinthians? Um, Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to read 23 to 25, and this should sound pretty familiar to you, and um, hopefully we'll bring back to mind some of the things that we've already talked about, and uh, this kind of goes back to the very first sermon I preached. The writer of Hebrews, whom uh, we don't know exactly, uh, says this, says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. You remember this? Um, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, like we're doing right now, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So about six or seven weeks ago, I said, so listen, that means that when we come together on a Sunday morning, and we're not neglecting coming together, but that we're coming together not just for the purpose of being fed, like, like we want you to come here and to, be, to be, hear the Word of God, to hear it uh, taught, to worship God, of course, all those things, to, um, to be fed yourself, but there's something else going on here that you should be thinking about, and that is that when you come together, you're also here to be actively engaged in the work of the ministry through this church. So that means you don't come just as an observer, as a casual observer, you come as a participant of what's going on. And so um, I said, you know, when we look at this, we're looking at like, you should be here and you should, hey, it's some sort of conversation you get into that you should stir up love in someone that you have a conversation with. That, that sometime this week, because of that conversation with you, that they're going to choose to to love someone else instead of, you know, maybe not love them. <laughs> Um, that you're here on a Sunday morning to, to stir people up to good works. Like, so that means when somebody leaves here, they go out into this community and they're, they're stirred up to do something good in their community, in their lives, in their friends, in, the, in their neighbors' lives. Something good. They're going to they're gonna do this because of some conversation with you, because you encourage them, or even just to encourage them in their faith. That they're, they're kind of getting, man, they're kind of getting frustrated with something that's not going right, or they don't feel like they, they feel like they've lost their connection with the Lord. And then something you speak to them this morning puts a little wind into their sails and uh, they leave here just encouraged in their faith because of you. You have a role in this. You have, a, you have a part to play. I'll do as much as I can from here, but I'm one dude, and uh, we need the body to engage. So this was a, several weeks ago. You should uh, hopefully remember that. The question I'm going to ask us today is, so when that doesn't come naturally to us, um, when putting the wind in someone else's sails doesn't really come naturally to us, how do we do the things that God has called us to do. And so today's message uh, for this final, this is our final message in this series called Together. Um, today's message is called Serve. So when we come to a Sunday morning, we gather together and we serve, and we're going to look at not only why we do that, which is important, but we're going to look at how we are empowered to do it. Um, today, I'm going to talk a lot about the Holy Spirit, um, because we have not been left alone to live out the calling that God has placed on our lives. We have a helper, the Spirit of God. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God is indwelling you. He is inside of you. He is ready to empower you. He is ready to gift you. He is ready to work through you. Now we have, we'll talk about this in a second, we have the ability to shut that down, to not humble ourselves and to submit to His leadership. We call it in the Scriptures, it's called quenching the Spirit. But, um, but the Spirit of God wants to live through you, because the things that God has asked us to do, we'll see, uh, the kingdom things that God has asked us to do are not, we are not able to do them without the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us. Uh, I love the way A.W. Tozer, I talk a lot about Tozer because he's just one of my favorite authors. I love the way he says this. Listen, he says, Christianity says, you shall receive power. In other words, there is a potency to enter your nature from another world. It is a moral and a spiritual force which is to come to you through faith and it is to enable you to be not what the books say you should be or the pastors say you should be, um, 
but what God says you should be. It is a potent force from another world invading your life by your consent, getting to the roots of your life and transforming you into his likeness. Um, so we, we cannot live a Christian life. We cannot live a biblical, cannot live a godly life without the Holy Spirit empowering us. We can't do it in our own strength. So a simple illustration, maybe you've seen this before. I grabbed my welding glove. Um, it's like this glove. There it is on the ground. Like, I don't care how much you talk to the glove. I don't care how much you're like, yeah, man, you can do this. Like, I want you to go out and pick up that shovel or pick up that welding torch. And I want you to, do, come on, you can do it. You know, like, I don't care how nicely you talk to the thing. It is never going to, you know, do anything unless there is a force of life that comes into it, right? This is you and the kingdom work that God has for you. It is empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. He is the life force. He is that potent force. How does Tozer say it? He is that potent force from another world invading your life by your consent. Now, like I said, you can say no to this. Yeah, I don't want that kind of, maybe I'm, I don't like that sort of thing. We can say no to it. We can, we can quench the spirit. But if we say yes to it, then it is a potent force from another world invading your life, uh, getting to the roots of your life and transforming you into his likeness. This is the role of the Holy Spirit, and he gifts us with his power. Okay? So if you still have your Bibles open, we're going to turn to probably one of the best passages talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we have in the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I'm going to read the first 11 verses of this. We're going to look at this idea because God hasn't left you alone to do the things that he's called you to do. He has filled you with his power. He's given you everything you need to do that. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 11. Paul says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. This is that empowerment that God gives us to live out his kingdom life. You can't do that without the Holy Spirit. Verse 4, now there are varieties of gifts but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Pay attention to that phrase. Verse 8, for to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Okay, so we're going to pause there. I'm going to give you a little definition here that I think might be helpful for us to understand. Um, what are the spiritual gifts? What are spiritual gifts? And so number one on your outline, gifts of the Spirit are special abilities and power. Special abilities and power um, given by the Holy Spirit to Christians for the purpose of building others up. So if you've been in church for a while, you've probably heard uh, some teaching, I'm hoping or assuming along the way, about the gifts of the Spirit. Um, and hopefully you know, if you've been in church for a while, you know how God has gifted you, how He's given you gifts to um, build up the body of Christ. If you don't know what your gifts are, then I would recommend figuring that out. And you can look at the scriptures I gave you on your outline. There's several different um, passages where Paul talks about the gifts of the Spirit, and there's a whole bunch of them listed out. Um, you can get online even uh, and, and look and just do a the spiritual gifts test and see, and you can go through that and see maybe, and when you go through it, hopefully something will stir inside of your heart and you go, oh yeah, that's, that's totally me. That's the way I'm wired. I love that sort of a thing. And you'll see what, what your gifts are. Um, that's if you've been in the church for a while. If you haven't been in the church for a while, you may not know that the spiritual gifts have caused a lot of controversy through the years. Um, these things have been incredibly divisive. And I think at the root of the controversy is a misunderstanding of why God gives us the gifts in the first place. 
And so I want to make sure that's very clear to you, clear to you today. Uh, if you look back at verse 7, I read this and I had you pay special attention to the phrase. It says, to each is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good for the common good. I think that's, we, that's where we need to start. Paul reiterates that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. He says, uh, you've been given the gifts to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. That's what God has given us the gifts for the building up of the body of Christ. Uh, I learned this from a friend of mine, David Booth, a couple of weeks ago. He's talking about Martin Luther. And Martin Luther has this idea that when the scriptures teach, that what they teach about man is that man is curved inward on ourselves. And so it, he says he's so curved in upon himself that he uses not only physical, but even spiritual goods for his own purposes and in all things seeks only himself. So this is Martin Luther King's kind of diagnosis of the human problem is that we're just thinking things for ourselves. Even if we try hard to, it's really difficult to escape the gravity of self-interest. And most of us would look at that and look at our own lives and go, ah, that's, that's, probably, that's probably really true. We are so curved in upon ourselves is what Martin Luther says. So, so the gifts of the Spirit, which have been given for the building up of the body of Christ, for the building up of the church, suddenly somehow become all about us. Number two, God poured unique power and ability into each of you so that you may build up the church. If you are using your gift in a way that is not building the church, then you are misusing it, okay? Matter of fact, I'm going to stand on a little bit of a soapbox here for a few minutes, if you wouldn't mind. Um, I'm going to dive right in here and say to those of you who have a prayer language for personal edification, God bless you. That is a beautiful, beautiful thing, a beautiful gift from God. But using that gift in public must be for the good of others. It must be for the building up of the body of Christ. This is what Paul says just two chapters later in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. You should read that verse. Or you should read that passage. He says things like, Now, brothers, I come, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? He says, In church, I would... In church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. He says, so with yourself, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Strive to excel in building up the church. Brothers, do not be children, he says, in your thinking. Be infants. But you know what we do? We take it and we kind of curve it back to ourselves. It's like this, this sort of curvature of our, of our lives come back and self-interest is a high, one of Satan's favorite things to do. And we talked about this. I told you this over and over because he's wily. He is so, he's got such a great scheme here and he deceives us as he takes the thing that was meant for good, that was meant for building, that was meant to do good, and he twists it just enough so that thing starts to do evil in our lives. And he does it all over the place because Satan is not a creator. He is a breaker. Amen? That's what he does. He comes in and he breaks. He takes good functioning things that should be given to the church for the building up of the body of Christ, and he takes them so that they would no longer serve that purpose for God. They would do the opposite. He does it with all kinds of stuff. He did it with sex, one of God's best gifts to humanity. Don't say amen. That'll get really awkward. We're just not even going to move. <laughs> just, just leave that at that. But they but like twisted it. And, and he made it perverse. And now what it does is it breaks up marriages. It doesn't build up marriages. It breaks them up. It's used as a, as a weapon. He did it with creation. I go out all the time into the mountains and I look around at the beauty that God has created. And I'm like, this beauty was meant to point to the power and to the glory of God. And what happens? It becomes an object of worship all in and of itself. He takes this beautiful thing that God created for some beautiful purpose and he twists it just enough so that it's broken for God's purposes. It's not used. And he does it with the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit is this amazing empowerment by the Holy Spirit in each and every one of our lives. And Satan comes in there and somehow he twists it and he makes it all, all about ourselves. He makes it all about us. He uses it to break down the church, not to build it up. Matter of fact, I'm going to just say, he has, I think, um, he has divided us by playing these two extremes against each other. Let me tell you what one extreme is. One extreme is something like, man, that church is ineffective 
without miraculous manifestations of the Spirit. Matter of fact, if you're, if you're not speaking in tongues, you don't even have the Holy Spirit in you. Man, if people aren't being healed in your church, then obviously you guys don't have enough. If, if there is no working of miracles in your church, then there is obviously no anointing in your church, right? So this is one extreme. It says, man, if you're not miraculous manifestations of the Spirit, if those don't exist, then, then the Spirit must not be in your church. Here's the other extreme, that, that um, God doesn't empower the church like that anymore. Oh, those things stopped. We call this cessationism, which is this idea that the gifts have ceased. Like, oh, God just needed to empower the church when it was early, when it was young. So he did it through Peter, did it through Paul, but he stopped doing that nowadays. And so we don't, we don't really deal in the miraculous anymore. I'm going to tell you that neither one of these extremes are going to find a home in today's message, okay? Neither one of them are going to find a home here. Paul says, now concerning the gifts of the Spirit, I don't want you to be uninformed. I want you to be informed. The gifts of the Holy Spirit, they're not only biblical, they are powerful, and they equip the church to be the church. They equip us to do the things that God has for us to do. So I'm going to say this as your pastor. This is not going to be a source of division in this church. If you want to divide over this sort of thing, then I highly recommend another church. I can give you some names. I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. It's not very kind to of me. This is just going to be a place where the gifts of the Holy Spirit are going to be used to build up the church. That is why our Father in heaven gave them to us. So we're not going to allow Satan to come in here and start to break stuff, twist it and break it. Amen? Okay, uh, moving on from that. That was my soapbox moment. Uh, number two, God poured unique power and ability into you so that you can build up the church. Number three, your spiritual gift is an important part of the whole. Uh, if you look at verse four, it says, now there are a varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but the same God who empowers them all and everyone. Notice all the diversity in that. You see, like all the different possibilities there, there's a variety of gifts, of service, of activities, but it's the same spirit. God has given you one or more, maybe, of these gifts. So what I want to do is I want to take a quick look at some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. This is going to be a comprehensive list, but it's going to be something to kind of give you an idea of the ways that God has gifted the church um, to, give it, to give it this kind of power. And so like I said earlier on your outline or a couple of other places. I'm mainly taking from his time in Corinthians, but there's a couple of other places that Paul lists different spiritual gifts, and so you can look up the entire complete list uh, if you want to. But you'll find, I'm hoping, that you'll find that most of these gifts um, are broad enough that you'll find a home somewhere herein. And so we'll let's start off. You'll see um, things like service and helps listed quite a few times. Like God has supernaturally gifted some of you to, be, uh, to live lives of service and of helps. We're all called to serve, of course, that's part of it. But some of you, and you know these people when you meet them, they have just been like supernaturally empowered to serve people. They, God somehow, he uses that gift of service very powerfully in, their, in, their, in people's lives. I'll never forget, we had this older lady uh, named Vicki who, you know, in, in Lake Almanor, who used to just, she was, I don't know, 78 or something, but she was part of my youth group team, and, and she would come. And I'll never forget this moment in Costa Rica. We were down there with a group of students, and uh, we were digging this ditch for this pipeline to come from this little well and to come all the way down to this village. And we were, it was hot. It was muggy. There were bugs everywhere. It was like just kind of really difficult work environment. And I was looking there, and, and I'm sweating and just, just dripping in my eyes. And I was like digging this ditch, and, and um, Vicky comes up to me, and I didn't even see her, kind of like sneak attack out of the corner of my eye with this cold, wet washcloth. And she just like whoosh, wipes my face with it. And I was like, first of all, you know, like, what the heck is happening? And uh, I see her going from person to person to person, just wiping their sweat off of their faces. It's this cool moment. Some, some people they're just empowered. That God gifted them in some way. I don't know what it was, but I'm sure it was good. Um, <laughs> he's going to empower them to, to serve. He empowered them. Um, some of you have the gift of encouragement. Uh, this is a, the guy Barnabas in Acts chapter 4. You've, you've probably heard of him. Does anybody know that Barnabas wasn't his original name? Does anybody know what his real name is? Anybody know? Okay. Yeah, it's Joseph. This guy, Joseph, comes to them, and, but this guy is such an encourager to the apostles that they, they rename him. They're like, we're going to rename you. We've got a name for you. It's Barnabas, and his Barnabas means son of encouragement, son of encouragement. We have a cat right now. His name is Barnabas. Um, I, have, I have renamed that cat Barabbas. 
Um, that, is, that is the new cat name. That cat is not an encourager. He is the spawn of Satan. That's a different story. Um, that's a different thing. Can I just show you a little video? I think I've showed you this before, but it's just great. It always makes me happy. Oh, you're not just going to walk away and give up. I'm stuck. You can get that. That's yours. Nobody else. Get in there and give it some heat. Give it some heat. Give it some heat. Get in there. Isn't that cool? <laughs> oh, he makes me laugh when I see that thing. But I'm telling you right now, God has supernaturally empowered some of you to be encouragers. And you have no idea what kind of power you have. I'm telling you right now, I would not be here. I would not if it hadn't been for the encouragers in my life. The people who saw something and they said something, and they encouraged me. This is what God does. He gives us these gifts so that we might build up the church. See what he's doing? All throughout Scripture are these moments when God uses people. He empowers them. He gives them gifts, um, gifts of wisdom. Some of you, gifts of knowledge. You just have this amazing ability to, to remember and to recollect and, and to share things like that. He's some, given you some of, some of you gifts of faith, which is something we all have, of course. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. But he has gifted some of you, and I've met you because, it, like Jesus says, I just say something to this mountain, it'll go and throw itself into the, mount, into the sea. Like, I believe that you could do that. <laughs> like, I've met you because and just people have this, like, faith that just comes out of them. And I'm over here with all my doubts. These are the reasons why I can't happen. They're like, no, 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 you don't know God. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And God has gifted people. He's gifted us. Um, and then we get to the miraculous gifts, like, like miracles and, and healings and, and tongues. And you see this coming up in the early church. We're going to jump into the book of Acts in a couple of weeks. I'll just tell you right now, um, I'm like, I don't know, nine sermons into the book of Acts. And uh, it I'm like on chapter four, so it's going to be a long, long trip through the, uh, through the book of Acts. We're going to start that in a couple of weeks, but you, you see, man, God just comes and empowers Peter, empowers Paul, and they, they have these moments, and again, some people say like, oh, that's just back then. That was just in the church age when, the, when God was starting off the church. I'm like, have you looked around lately? Have you seen our world? Have you seen our culture? I think God still needs to be empowering the church like that. He still needs to be the miracle working God that I believe he is, and God has gifted some of you. He has gifted, you know, in kind of this amazing way. You've been gifted by God to pray and to work in miraculous ways. And the way that you can do that is something that I even look back and I stand there and go, man, how does that even happen? Because God has gifted some of you that way. Those gifts aren't dead. They are alive in you and some of you. And so we, we look at all these things. You see how we're doing this? We're looking at all these different ways that God has equipped the body. Why? For the building up of the body of Christ, for the building up of, of the church. So there's enough diversity in these gifts. And again, that was just a quick snapshot. It's not all of them. Um, but you should be able to find your home in that list. And what Paul says right after that, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, is he starts to talk about the body of Christ. So the reason those two are connected so closely together is because he recognizes that God has gifted the church and he's gifted different people. There's a variety of gifts, a variety of manifestations of the Spirit. And, that's all. and then he says, and we are all part of one body. And he talks about how we are all joined together as one body, and we are functioning like that. And at the head of the body is Christ, is Jesus, and he is the one guiding and directing all of us. Some of us is a, is a foot, some of us is a hand, some of us is an ear. We all have different roles, we all have different parts. We are all one body, but each one is a different part of it. So your gift is a part of the spiritual whole. Your gift is a part of the spiritual whole. God has chosen you and he has arranged you and he has gifted you so that you might serve the body of Christ. So number four on your outline, be careful then not to elevate certain gifts over any other gifts because we're all part of the whole. Oftentimes what we do is we take the way that God has gifted us and we say, man, this is the most important thing. You guys, you're missing it if this church isn't really strong. Like Paul, hey, I've gifted you to teach and I'm going to give you everything you need to do to teach. And I stand in front of him like, okay, Lord, but 
work with me, buddy, here for just a second. I got another plan. Um, what I'd really like to do, just imagine how much more effective I could be if I could walk around and just and bring healing to people. I could work miracles in people's lives. God is, God is not interested in building up the whole church in one gift. He is interested in building up all of our gifts. And so sometimes what happens is a church will kind of tend to emphasize certain gifts. And so they become strong in those areas, but then they kind of walk with a lean. It's like a bodybuilder who's like, dude, I love my right arm. You know, like doing curls all the time, one arm push-ups all the time. And then like Twiggly Wiggly over here is just like dangling. And this guy's like, hey, what's going on? He's like walking with a lean because he's in, he's, one part of his body is really strong and the rest of it has been neglected. There is a variety of gifts and there is a variety of opportunities for us to exercise those gifts. So we got to be careful of not elevating certain gifts. Like, ooh, we value the gift of leadership so much that we're just creating a bunch of leaders and then disaster strikes and you have a bunch of chiefs running around and there's nobody to, that's cultivated a servant's heart. That nobody knows who, how to do the work of the ministry. I believe that God builds the church family and he gifts it in such a way that there isn't anything lacking among us. That we are, as a church family, we are complete as a body. And so in a perfect world, whenever some kind of a need comes up, that we would say, oh yeah, man, I know somebody who has been gifted in that area, who can speak some truth into your life. Some of, some, some of you have the gifts of mercy. And you know, I'll hear about someone's difficulty or trouble, and um, I can receive it, and I'll pray for it. But like some of you have that way to just receive it like down in your heart and your soul, and you can speak some sort of truth into someone's life that I can't, I can't really do. That's because God has gifted you in that Wait, so this one local church can do all the ministry of the church, but only if we step up and we do our part, which kind of brings us back to where we started, and I'll get ready to kind of wrap things up here. Verse 7, to each is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So we've all been gifted by the Holy Spirit for the strengthening of the church. The first time Paul ever uses that phrase, um, spiritual gifts is in Romans chapter 1, verse 11. He says, For I long to see you that I may impart some spiritual gift to strengthen you. So listen, if you are part of a church family, if you're part of a body, and you are not using the gifts that God has given you, then one of two things is going to be happening at that church. One is it's going to kind of walk with a lean, right? And we've got one strong area, but we have this other deficiency. The other is, and this is probably a lot more common in this church because we have some amazing people, when, um, when someone sees a hole, they'll be living out their gift, and now all of a sudden, even though they're not necessarily gifted out that, just because they want to be of service, they're going to jump in and they're going to take your place. And they're going to fill the hole that you were created, wired, gifted to fill. They're going to take that over and they're going to start doing it. Um, so one of those two things. So when you start to live out your gifts, when you start to live in your gifts, what you're doing is you're stepping into the church and saying, listen, nobody else has to carry my load. I'm going to do this. I'm part of this with you. As a matter of fact, when Paul says that it is for the common good, um, that word is translated in a couple different ways. If you have, I think it's NIV, translated, translates it as profitable which should kind of be a gut check for all of us. Is my gift a profit to the church? Am I profiting the church with the ways that God has gifted me? Or am I just here to receive from other people's giftings? But if you don't step up and live in your calling, if you don't step up and use your gift, then someone else is probably going to end up having to fill that hole for us. Do you engage in ministry as though you are part of, of a bigger family, as part of a church body? Um, one of the lies that I want to combat this morning, and this is just as prevalent in the church as it is out in the rest of the world, is that it just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter if I step up and do my thing. It just doesn't matter. They're going to be fine without me. I'm like, seriously, I said this earlier. Have you looked outside lately? We need you. We need you to be a part of the work that God is doing in his kingdom through the church. Not just this church, all the churches. God needs the people of God to step up and to live out the calling that he has set on their lives. Using your gift makes an eternal difference in the kingdom of God. It is something you should be doing. And it's, again, it's not just like, oh, I'm just taking my, my cool little talents and I'm just using them for God. No, what if, what if we saw it like this and it was like, no, man, I'm, I'm taking the things that God has created me for and I'm allowing his spirit to come in and fill me and give me power. And now I can do not just good things, not just kind things. Now I can do kingdom things because of the spirit inside of me. Amen. 
this is what God has called us to. And as we kind of wrap up this series and we start moving on to other things, um, I, I kind of want to leave us with this idea that the same power that came into the church 2,000 years ago is still available and working through each and every one of us. So let's not keep shutting it down, quenching him, and let's let him actually do what he wants to do. Amen? Amen. All right. Whoa. All right. Clap to that. Go ahead and stand to your feet, and we'll, we'll close it out today. A word of prayer.